we're very pleased to have Dr. Tibor Salagi. He is a technical officer with WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. He is a medical doctor. He started his work in tobacco control way back in 1998 uh, in Hungary. He also has a, a master's in traditional Chinese medicine, something most of our speakers can't say. Uh, he joined the Convention Secretariat in 2007, and since 2010, he's been primarily involved in helping countries actually implement these tobacco controls. So to talk about the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, Dr. Salagi, thanks so much for being here. Thank you very much, Linda, and uh, good to see you, and uh, it's uh, very good to be here with you. This is the first time that I'm together with so many journalists, in fact, and uh, I recall a story back in Hungary a couple of years ago when uh, uh, right after the entry into force of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, the national television visited me in my place, uh, at my house, and they came early, and I was still not uh, dressed up properly, and I was in slippers, and they wanted to take the footage in the garden. And I asked them, can I uh, keep my slippers on? I should, I, should I take shoes? Uh, would that be seen in the footage? And they said, no, it will not be seen. And then they saw that they, uh, I have two dogs, and they said that, uh, can you please play a little bit with the dogs? We'll use that as a background footage. And of course, yes, but again, uh, should I be in shoes? And they said, no, it will not be seen. And of course, in prime time in the national television, of course I was seen in slippers playing with my dogs in the garden. So that was one of my memories when I uh, also spoke about the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. So I woke up uh, quite early this morning to put on my shoes and not uh, coming in slippers. So it's, uh, again, great to be here, and thank you very much for this invitation. And uh, indeed, my uh, talk would be about the first ever uh, public health treaty, which was developed by uh, WHO under the auspices of the WHO, and which entered into force uh, exactly 10 years ago. And we celebrated, it was about uh, two weeks ago that we celebrated the 10th anniversary of the entry into force of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, and we had celebration in Geneva uh, for the uh, permanent missions, which are based in Geneva, and also we had uh, invitees from different countries, uh, ministers and high-level officials, and also the different uh, WHO regions and countries have also celebrated some of them the entry into force of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. So let's start with uh, uh, saying that uh, this treaty, which uh, has entered into force uh, on the 27th uh, February 2005, is the first ever public health treaty, which was uh, negotiated by the WHO, the World Health Organization, has in its mandate uh, to develop international treaties on public health matters which concern uh, uh, most of the countries and many different regions. So it was the first ever public health treaty negotiated and it was negotiated by WHO and it's a binding international law. So once the countries ratify the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, they are bound to it and they uh, should be implementing all its requirements. It's a new model. We never used before uh, the model of an international treaty uh, to address a public health matter. It's a new model for effective response uh, to the negative effects of globalization on health. And you have heard during the presentations in the uh, past two days, which uh, you all attended, uh, what huge uh, health impact tobacco has. So that was uh, very proper that the WHO has initiated the development of an international treaty for that. The treaty uses a comprehensive approach. It combines many different measures which were found effective in the past years before the entry into force uh, of the convention. And how we call them uh, uh, demand and supply side measures. And I will show you which kind of uh, measures are referred to in the convention. And it also uses a multi-sectoral approach. I'm also sure that uh, you heard about this, that the implementation of this treaty is no longer uh, the responsibility of the health sector alone. All the different sectors of the governments 
from finance uh, through agriculture uh, to education, trade and industry, they all have their responsibilities and they all need to bring their contribution for this treaty to be fully implemented. So it uses a multi-sectoral approach. And finally, it is for the first time that exchange of information, expertise and technologies and multilateral cooperation in the area of tobacco control became part of an international uh, public health treaty. So uh, this is the uh, um, evolution of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. I don't know if, uh, if it can be clearly seen from the back, but you will have this, this presentation available uh, to all of you. But you can see that the treaty um, has been developed over a period of about 10 years. Oh, sorry. How can I start the pointer? Okay, it's here. So in fact, uh, the development of this treaty was started in 1996 when the World Health Assembly of the WHO has uh, uh, decided about the development of an, international, uh, uh, of an international treaty, a framework convention in the area of tobacco. And then there were about uh, uh, four years of negotiations uh, run by a so-called intergovernmental negotiating body composed of representatives of different countries that are member states to WHO. So they all participated in the negotiating process. And then, uh, sorry, that was an intergovernmental negotiating body and a technical working group that was established by the WHJ and eventually the negotiations uh, started in uh, uh, 2000. And then it was uh, up until 2003 in May that the World Health Assembly, the supreme decision-making body of the WHO, World Health Organization, adopted this international treaty. So it was in May 2003. And if you check the uh, um, content of the treaty and uh, look for the entry into force of this treaty, then you will see that we uh, needed 40 countries to ratify this international treaty before it enters into force globally. So it took about two years from May 2003 until February 2005 that 40 countries from all around the world have ratified the framework Convention on Tobacco Control, and Norway was the first country uh, to ratify uh, the treaty uh, back in June 2003. But it took about two years for the 40 countries to ratify, so eventually the treaty entered into force in February 2005. And once the treaty has entered into force, it became an international law, and it became um, a must for its requirements to be implemented by those countries which have ratified it. Over the years, uh, we um, had 140 other countries ratifying the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. So today, we have 180 parties to it. But let's continue with the evolution of the treaty. Uh, after the treaty has entered into force, uh, the uh, supreme decision-making body of the treaty itself, the conference of the parties, was called to existence. So the first session of the conference of the parties was held in Switzerland, in Geneva, uh, in 2006. Then the second session of the conference was held in Thailand, and uh, the third session in South Africa in 2008. So in the first three years, we had a conference of the parties every year, and then the conference has turned to a biennial cycle. So the next uh, conference of the parties was held in 2010 in Uruguay, then in uh, Republic of Korea in 2012, 
And the last COP, uh, number six, was held in the Russian Federation in Moscow in October last year. And we expect the next one uh, to take place in India sometime in later 2016. And as I said, we celebrated the 10th anniversary of the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control in February this year. So again, it took about 10 years from the first idea of having an international treaty in the area of tobacco control until the convention uh, eventually entered into force in 2005. And now we are 10 years old. We are no longer a child. We are entering our adolescence, our uh, teenage years. The first 10 years were not easy, but the next 10 would not be easy either. There will be different problems, but challenges will remain. And I will speak a couple of words about uh, those challenges as well. So here you can see all the countries which have uh, already ratified the convention. Those are all in green. And most of the countries you are coming from have already ratified the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. But there are a few which have not. The United States, Argentina, and I would be happy to learn from you what do you think about uh, the reasons why these countries have not yet ratified the Framework Convention. Then Indonesia, another big country which has not ratified. Mozambique and some countries from uh, Africa, Morocco. And in the middle of Europe, where the seat of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control is placed in Switzerland. Switzerland has also not ratified the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. But I just attended a workshop for the European region, and uh, they have already a timeline for the ratification of the FCTC. And, uh, they, uh, they think uh, this will happen by 2018. But what about the other countries? We have heard about ongoing processes, but still the ratification in those 14 remaining countries has not taken place yet. One interesting <laughs> matter is that uh, as parties to the convention, we have 179 countries plus one uh, regional integration organization, the European Union. The European Union as entity has ratified the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control and is implementing it uh, within the mandate, within its mandate. So there is a shared responsibility between the member states of the European Union and the European Union itself. Uh, for the areas which should be taken care of by the union as an entity and by the member states. Of course, the member states are bound to the treaty and the European Union is also bound to the treaty. So it should be implementing every single word, every single requirement of the convention. But just to remind you that regional integration organization can also become parties to this convention. So 179 parties and uh, one regional integration organization. And uh, this is a graph showing how the number of the parties to the convention have increased uh, over the years. And uh, by the end of 2004, uh, we had the 40 countries. And uh, then the convention entered into force on the 90th day after the 40th ratification uh, of the convention. So it entered into force in 2005, in February. Then, in fact, there was a steep and fast increase in the number of the countries ratifying it. And uh, in fact, we used to say that the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control is among the fastest ratified international treaty in the UN history. And currently, we have uh, 180 parties. Zimbabwe was the 180th uh, party for which the convention enters into force this month. 
But we are no longer alone. The FCTC is the mother treaty, which have already given birth to a baby treaty, which is the uh, protocol to eliminate illicit trade in tobacco products. Since one in every 10 cigarettes and many other tobacco products in the world is illegal, and illicit trade in tobacco products uh, has great dangers to public health because it is uncontrolled, it is cheap, easily available to everyone, including uh, young people. And uh, of course, it uh, doesn't fall under the control of the regular tobacco products, which are uh, uh, usually regulated in a country, especially if that country is a, a party to the convention. So it was very important for the parties to the convention to take up the responsibility of developing another international um, uh, treaty in the area of illicit trade in tobacco products. And this has happened. And uh, between 2006 and 2009, uh, the parties to the convention negotiated this first protocol under the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. And uh, then the fifth session of the Conference of the Parties, which was held in Korea, adopted the protocol. And eventually, the protocol is now available for the parties for their uh, ratification. There are two things here. One, uh, only parties to the convention can ratify the protocol. So if uh, you are not a party to the uh, mother convention, you cannot be party of the protocol. So, for example, Switzerland should become first a party to the FCTC to be able to ratify uh, any protocol, any further protocol developed under the auspices of the FCTC. So, only parties to the convention uh, can become parties to the protocol. And so far, we have 54 parties to the, uh, uh, to the convention signing the protocol, but only six have ratified. And again, we need 40 parties to the convention to ratify the protocol so that it will enter into force. So we need 34 more uh, parties to the convention to ratify the protocol for it eventually to enter into force. And we, the Secretariat, would like to promote the ratification uh, of the protocol during this World Conference. There will be sessions on the protocol on illicit trade in tobacco products. There will be other sessions on illicit trade in tobacco. And if Frank uh, Chalupka is coming to visit you, then he will, I'm sure, also speak about uh, the illicit trade in tobacco products. Uh, so this is such an important matter and such an important area of, uh, which needs international cooperation because countries alone cannot solve the issue of illicit trade protocol. Illicit trade in tobacco products originates in one country and affects many others. There are hubs for illicit trade uh, in tobacco in different parts of the world. So it is very important for this protocol, again, to enter into force as an international treaty so that the countries can start together uh, working on this very important area. By the way, Article 15 of the Convention already refers to illicit trade in tobacco products. So in fact, the protocol was not created in a vacuum. It was based on the requirements of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, but as a protocol adds new obligations to the parties. So the Mother Treaty already contains some obligations, but if you ratify the protocol, that will mean new obligations for you if you are a country or a regional integration organization. So that it is, it is very important for these new obligations to be evaluated in advance so that uh, when you ratify it, when a country ratifies it, then uh, he is able to uh, take up at least the major requirements of this international protocol on a short term. So now back to the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. I'm sure that you have already seen this uh, booklet which contains all the different articles of the convention. 
and uh, there are a total of 38 articles, of which about 15 articles refer to the uh, measures which parties to the Convention are required to implement as they become a party to the Convention. And in fact, this is the list of the measures, at least the areas in which the parties need to work to uh, comply with the key provisions of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Let me go through them quickly. The first I would like to mention are the general obligations. General obligations is re are referred to in Article 5 of the Convention, and they refer uh, to the fact uh, that parties to the Convention are required to develop tobacco control strategies, action plans. Most of the measures required under the Convention need to be implemented by national legislation, through national legislation. So you cannot avoid developing tobacco control legislation in one piece or uh, legislation uh, referred to different aspects of the Convention can be uh, referred to in more pieces of legislation in the respective country. Some countries have, for example, uh, advertising laws which refer to tobacco advertising. Some countries have comprehensive uh, tobacco control laws which refer to uh, most, if not all, requirements of the Convention. Uh, taxation of tobacco products is usually referred to in a separate law, in the budget law or tax law or tax code. So it's uh, usually not part of the comprehensive tobacco control legislation. Um, so parties need to uh, go about uh, putting in place legislation for uh, many different areas referred to in the Convention, which could be in one piece or in more pieces of legislation. Then also uh, in this section, under Article 5, it is a very important uh, cross-cutting area referred to, which is the prevention of tobacco industry interference with uh, the public policy development, especially uh, tobacco control policies. So what does this mean? Tobacco industry should not have a seat at the negotiating table when tobacco control legislation is negotiated, when action plans are developed. The tobacco industry should be isolated um, from this process. The tobacco industry should, at the same time, be informed once the legislation is adopted for them to know what they are to comply with. But they should not have a seat at the negotiating table. Sometimes this is very difficult to achieve. And in fact, this is one of the most challenging areas in the implementation of the Convention. Many countries have state tobacco monopolies. They have interest in uh, tobacco manufacturing and sale. And it is very difficult to them to isolate the two functions. The function of developing tobacco control policies and complying with the FCTC, uh, to which uh, they may be a party already and isolating it from the fact that they are overseeing the national tobacco monopoly. So this is the case, for example, Thailand has state tobacco monopoly. China is very important uh, stakeholder in, uh, in FCTC, which also has a tobacco, control mono, uh, tobacco monopoly. So it is very important that these functions of the government of overseeing state tobacco monopolies and developing tobacco control policies along the lines uh, required by the Framework Convention is taking place. So please keep an eye on the uh, sessions during this conference on tobacco industry interference. It is a very important matter. And in fact, the parties to the Convention report tobacco industry interference as the main barrier of the implementation of the Framework Convention on tobacco control. This is one of the challenges we shall look into uh, more strongly in the future. It's a challenging area, and in the next 10 years of the evolution of the Convention, uh, it would be important to see how we can do more 
because we need to win this battle uh, with the tobacco industry to ensure that all requirements of the uh, Framework Convention uh, are put in place. You may have heard about uh, a screen test. Screen test is referred to uh, measures which are required under the convention, which makes the tobacco industry scream. scream. What are these measures? For example, taxation. They don't like rising taxes because it in, uh, increases prices so that the consumption will go down because the demand for tobacco products will go down. So tobacco industry doesn't like raising taxes. They don't like plain packaging. They don't like uh, pictorial warnings because they are effective means. So when you see in, uh, in a country that the tobacco industry is strongly opposing a measure, you can be sure that that measure, which is required under the convention, is one of the most effective ones. So this is what we call a scream test. And we need to uh, look for that and understand it so that we can counter it properly. Next, price and tax measures. It is very important, is among the most effective measures uh, required by the convention. It's Article 6 of the Convention. And uh, the next one is protection from exposure to tobacco smoke, smoke-free environments. This is among the most uh, implemented areas of the Convention. It is done by legislation. You should have legislation which uh, requires uh, smoke-free environments, which bans smoking or tobacco use in different public places. You may recall that from your countries, from your experience. Article 9 and 10 of the Convention refer to regulating the content of tobacco products and the disclosures of the content to government authorities and the public. Packaging and labeling of tobacco products is a very uh, uh, important area which uh, we have seen uh, so much progress in the past few years. And uh, you may recall countries which have uh, uh, legislated for plain packaging, for huge pictorial warnings, and I will give you a few examples on this. Education, communication, training, and public awareness. It is very important that the public and the different stakeholders in the countries, including the media and decision makers, are informed about uh, the tobacco control measures, what are the requirements of the convention, why they are needed, how do they work, and uh, the public and the different stakeholders need to be educated on this matter. Tobacco advertising promotion and sponsorship, banning it, it is a very important requirement under the convention. Tobacco dependence and cessation, so you not only ban and uh, you act to decrease the demand for tobacco, but you also provide means for the people uh, to get assistance when they quit smoking and uh, uh, you already had uh, uh, Dr. Prasad talking about uh, M cessation and uh, uh, innovative technologies in uh, tobacco control, tobacco dependence and cessation. Illicit trade in tobacco products, again, Article 15 of the Convention. It is already in the Convention. And this very article was then uh, uh, used as a basis for the development of the protocol to eliminate illicit trade in tobacco products sales to and by minors, sales of tobacco products to minors under 18 or as per the legal age in the country. Economically uh, viable alternative activities for tobacco growers. This is uh, a very important area which needs uh, intersectoral cooperation in the country. We need ministries of agriculture to make progress in this area. Liability. Uh, how the tobacco industry can be uh, brought to the court uh, for the damages it is doing to individuals and uh, to the economies of the countries. Research, surveillance and exchange of information and international cooperation. It is a very important area, very specific to the FCTC because countries should help each other, should share information about their implementation of the treaty which may help each other. So it is very important for the countries to work together for the full implementation 
of the Convention. So, these are the main uh, uh, areas of uh, work for the countries with specific requirements laid down in the Framework Convention. And now I would like to refer to uh, a couple of them in more uh, detail. First, I would like to mention the fact that two measures under the Convention are time-bound. So once the countries ratify the Convention, there are two measures which should be implemented according to a specific timeline. Packaging and labeling measures, um, for example, requirements for uh, package warnings of more than 50% uh, that rotate, that not only contain text but also pictures, should be implemented in, uh, in a period of three years after the ratification and entry into force of the convention for that particular party. Since most of the parties have uh, ratified the convention in 2004-2005, um, in fact, all, almost all parties to the convention um, already had to uh, introduce strong measures on packaging and labeling of tobacco products. The other time-bound measure is tobacco advertising promotion and sponsorship. The treaty requires parties to introduce a comprehensive ban on all forms of tobacco advertising promotion and sponsorship within five years of the entry into force of the convention for them. So these are the two measures that are required to be implemented according to a specific timeline. But what is this third one? Uh, on the area of uh, exposure to tobacco smoke, smoke-free environments, the conference of the parties have developed uh, guidelines for implementation. Guidelines for implementation assist parties in implementing specific requirements of the, uh, of the convention, but they do not add new requirements. So that's the difference between a protocol and the guideline. Both of them are developed by the parties to the convention. Both of them are adopted by the conference of the parties. But the protocol is a binding international tool. The guidelines contain recommendations on how to implement a specific measure under the convention. So there is a difference between the two. But since the convention is uh, mandatory for all its parties, if the parties have decided to develop guidelines, the guidelines uh, per se and by definition they are only recommendations. So one may feel that uh, they do not weigh that much at the, as the, conference, uh, as the uh, FCTC itself. But in fact, they are assisting parties in implementing specific requirements of the treaty. That is why they are still very important. So please, um, uh, please learn that the protocol is uh, a binding international treaty, is a binding law. Once you ratify it, you must implement it. The guidelines are recommendations. And in fact, before the treaty era, before the entry into force of the FCTC, the WHO has operated through guidelines, through recommendations in the area of tobacco control. And that, uh, what a paradigm shift meant in tobacco control was that uh, we have changed and, uh, from recommendations, from guidelines in the area of tobacco control, we shifted to have a binding international tool, the FCTC. So that was the difference between uh, the period before the FCTC and the FCTC now uh, is in place, which is a binding international law. So the guidelines for implementation of Article 8 also um, make a recommendation that the parties should introduce measures uh, to prevent and to protect their citizens from exposure to tobacco smoke as soon as possible. Um, as uh, preferably by the end of the fifth year of uh, implementation of the entry into force of the convention for them. So there are two strong requirements within the treaty itself, which are time-bound, 
and uh, there is one recommendation for the introduction of strong measures on uh, exposure to tobacco smoke in the guidelines for implementation of Article 8. In fact, the, con uh, the Conference of the Parties has already adopted eight guidelines for implementation of specific uh, areas, including guidelines on Article 5.3, tobacco industry interference, then uh, on exposure to tobacco smoke, on Article 9 and 10, uh, uh, regulation of contents and emissions, packaging and labeling, tobacco advertising promotion and sponsorship, tobacco cessation. So there are guidelines already available for the parties to assist them in their implementation work, developed and adopted by the conference of the parties. And here you see some uh, examples how uh, the parties have uh, moved forward in implementing the uh, packaging and labeling measures. This is the requirement for uh, plain packaging. Norway has also announced to go ahead with plain packaging very soon. This is a closed container uh, that, uh, uh, that hides, in fact, the tobacco products at the point of sale. So, in fact, this is what we call display ban. Ban on display of tobacco products at the points of sale is one of the latest forms of tobacco advertising promotion and sponsorship which can be also um, uh, banned at the point of sale. Now I would like to uh, speak a couple of words about the implementation of the convention by the parties. And as I said, implementation of the different uh, articles is, uh, is not always easy. Yes, please, Linda. Our experience is that uh, the tobacco industry, in fact, uh, is present in every single country. And interestingly, even if they don't have manufacturing facility, they are present through uh, the importers and uh, those organizations and entities which can promote the interests of the tobacco industry. Um, and you are absolutely right that uh, in some countries, especially those which have not ratified the convention, I, I also recall Indonesia, where the tobacco industry presence is, uh, is very powerful and uh, uh, they have strong influence in uh, decision makers. And this is the most important question, that what, uh, what are the areas and what are the ways the tobacco industry can influence policy makers and decision making? what level of access they have to decision makers. And for Argentina, I think it would be very important to, uh, to look into and follow the Article 5.3 guidelines, because the guidelines on Article 5.3 propose you measures on how to uh, prevent interference by the tobacco industry. For example, to develop a code of conduct for public health, professional, uh, public health officials on how to interact with the tobacco industry to limit interactions with the tobacco industry to the minimum necessary and only to the areas when you need to inform the tobacco industry about the uh, legislation and, and measures taken to which they need to comply. So it is very important that uh, uh, the measures preventing tobacco industry interference are strengthened. And I think that this is the difference between the countries which have successfully uh, taken up and countered tobacco industry interference and those which have not. What we also see in the countries which have not ratified the convention is they are, uh, they are tobacco growing countries. And uh, they may feel that uh, when acting against, uh, uh, against the tobacco industry or they may feel that they act against tobacco growers. But in fact, it's not about the tobacco growers. The treaty is not against the tobacco growers. The treaty requires the governments to assist tobacco growers to start growing something else and not tobacco. So this is the, how the treaty works. But I think these are the two uh, most important areas and key areas, Article 5.3 and 17, finding measures for tobacco growers to help them to shift away from tobacco growing and grow something else.
two questions. Uh, firstly, when you say binding, what does it mean? What happens when a country violates? And does sponsorship extend to the sponsorship of political parties? The second question is easy because we have it in the guidelines. Yes, uh, sponsorship to political parties need to be banned. But again, it's in the guidelines. It's a recommendation. We have good examples of the countries which uh, have already banned the sponsorship on, uh, uh, of the tobacco industry to, uh, to political parties. And that can be easily introduced in the national legislation. And this is a new trend which we see in implementation that parties to the convention include measures under Article 5.3 in their national legislations. That was not a tradition before the treaty. So this is a change which was brought to existence by the FCTC. That Article 5.3, Tobacco Industry Interference, is referred to in the National Tobacco Control Legislations. It should be there. And your other question was about uh, binding. Yes, it is a, a binding international law, but there are no fines or any measures for non-compliance in the treaty itself. There were discussions at the sixth session of the Conference of the Parties in October 2014 to establish a so-called compliance committee, which many other international treaties have. And they established it after a couple of years' existence. For example, human rights treaties, environmental treaties. They, uh, most of them have a standing committee composed of the parties to that international treaty which look into compliance related matters. So uh, COP6 have discussed this and have taken a decision um, to establish not a per se, by definition, compliance committee, but a committee which can be a predecessor of, uh, of such a compliance committee. So they have taken steps towards having such a compliance committee, but we still need to pursue this in, in the future and at the next sessions of the Conference of the Parties to enable that uh, uh, there will be a full and uh, by definition compliance committee for the FCTC as well. So this is still not in place. It's a challenge for the future, but uh, uh, my position is that we need to go into this direction to strengthen implementation of the treaty. Um, doctor, I'd like to ask you, how does the World Health Organization and the Convention enforce somehow um, the implementation of the provision, key provisions or obligations of the countries that have ratified the Convention? And what happens when they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing? Mm -hmm. And please let me give you just one example of that. Um, it's a well-known fact that there is uh, illicit trade of tobacco products in Paraguay. And Paraguay is one of the countries that has ratified the convention. So what happens? The parties have to report regularly on their implementation. So every second year we receive an implementation report. We review that implementation report. And since uh, COP6 have now established this expert committee to look into the reports, the part, um, for the time being, it is not mandatory for the countries to, or for the convention secretariat or for the conference of the parties to look into the compliance of individual parties. But from uh, this point on, after the COP6 decision, parties may require this expert committee which was established to, to look into reporting and compliance related matters to ask them to refer to the compliance with the requirements of the treaty of the respective party. So if Paraguay will send its next implementation report in 2016, they should send us a letter saying that we would like uh, this expert group to also look into the compliance matters. So then you will receive a response on uh, which articles are you complying with fully which are the areas where there is no compliance or less compliance. 
so that you, uh, you can get a more detailed feedback on your implementation work. Again, this is some kind of uh, initial step towards a full compliance committee, which uh, will then be mandatory for all the parties. But for the time being, this is the mechanism which we have. And we also have another mechanism uh, which uh, assists parties in their implementation work, which is called needs assessment. Needs assessment is a mission which is done jointly by the country and the convention secretariat. So we travel to the country and we look uh, at the implementation work together with the country. We go article by article and we write a report about uh, which are the areas which are covered, this is missing, this is again uh, not fully implemented. So if Paraguay requests a needs assessment from uh, the convention secretariat, then we can go and uh, we can work with the government authorities to, to look into compliance related matters. But again, this is by, uh, by the request of the country. It is not mandatory. Uh, we can only do uh, uh, whatever assistance we can make if we are requested by Paraguay. But there is no uh, mandatory mechanism to look into compliance. Uh, hello, Tiba. I'm yes. from China. And I have a question is, uh, well, you know, the FCTC uh, was effective in China uh, more than nine years ago. However, uh, many of the articles, uh, they do not uh, take uh, good measures to uh, to do that. So I would like to know, are those articles uh, required or are they obligatory? And uh, one more thing is in China, um, the selling uh, tobacco and tobacco control, um, you, you know, uh, the one of the uh, a department of the government uh, is responsible for both uh, selling tobacco and tobacco control. So. Um, are those articles required or obligatory to Chinese government? And if uh, they do not take good measures, um, what can we do? Uh, is it a kind of an international law or just uh, uh, something like, uh, well, uh, I, I, I would like to join it or, um, and, um, and it's not obligatory or not. I, I would like to know this. Thank you. Uh, let me just say that, that all articles to the convention are mandatory. So once you ratified, you need to implement it. But in the FCTC itself, there is no clause which, uh, which requires uh, the, or establishes uh, fines or any repercussions if uh, there is no implementation. There is the Vienna. Uh, there is the Vienna Convention we can refer to, which, uh, which says that uh, international treaties need to be implemented. But that's it. In the FCTC itself, there is no such a clause. So at this point, uh, what, what can be done if China requests again the Secretariat to work with them and to see which are the areas of work which need more strengthening, then we can do that. But again, upon request, there is no mandate given to the convention secretariat uh, to impose any, uh, some kind of, uh, of, of visit or any, any other measure, to impose any other measure for non-compliance. We can just slightly remind parties about uh, uh, non-implementation. And in fact, if, uh, if someone looks into the um, uh, implementation report of China, you can, you can see the questions which are responded by no are the areas which are not yet implemented. So everyone can see. And the reports of the countries are public. They need to be made public. And they are shared on our website um, um, freely. So it's uh, accessible. Uh, well, one more thing. Uh, you know that. Uh... Uh, one, one more sentence. Uh, China has moved. Uh, uh, towards having a new comprehensive legislation, which we saw it. They requested us to, to review it, and the Secretariat has reviewed and we made comments. So we are assisting as much as possible. And that includes, that will include uh, smoking ban and strengthening of the tobacco advertising promotion and sponsorship rules. So there is some, some kind of movement. And uh, as I referred to, uh, the uh, state tobacco monopoly is, uh, is an important concern. Just a quick question, Doctor. I, it seems rather ironic that in the country which formed the convention that 
hasn't ratified it. I'm wondering if Switzerland has given a specific reason why it won't sign the convention. Um, there's no need for them to, to give us reasons because uh, before uh, becoming parties to the convention, they do not report to us. So uh, what I know, because I attended this conference two weeks ago, that they need to follow a very uh, specific and quite lengthy procedure of ratification of any international treaty. And what is, more, uh, what is very important for Switzerland, they would like to put everything in place, what is required under the convention, before ratifying it. That takes time. So they will uh, adopt, um, hopefully, national tobacco control legislation in 2017. That is the timeline. So that in 2018, they can ratify the convention. This is what we were told at the conference. Um, if a country you know, has itself very good uh, tobacco control laws and regulations or, and measures, does it still need FCTC? And any incentives for them to join FCTC, you know, in terms like uh, trade, international trade or something else? The uh, benefits of joining the FCTC is that uh, from that point on, you can participate at the conference of the parties with full right to vote. Until you are not parties uh, to the convention, you are just observer to the conference of the parties. You can observe, but you cannot vote. You cannot oppose to measures. You cannot uh, discuss. You cannot have your voice uh, uh, heard in a way that it is included in the final documents and so on. So there are many benefits uh, for a country to become a party to the convention. But if you uh, don't become a party before uh, becoming uh, a party to the convention, uh, the, uh, for example, the assistance framework which exists under the convention do not apply to you. For example, the Secretariat provides assistance for the countries in implementation work, but we cannot provide uh, technical and financial assistance to the countries that have not yet ratified. Uh, the convention. So once you ratify, you will benefit from the assistance framework of the convention, and at the same time, you can have full right to vote at the convention, at the uh, conference of the party sessions. Hi. Oh, you had one more question. Yes. We do not have the mandate to do so. The conference of the parties did not give the secretariat a mandate, nor the, has the conference of the parties the mandate to exert any pressure on the countries that have not yet ratified the convention. Okay, hi, I'm Jamal from Indonesia. Um, I need your comment about this. In Indonesia, we believe that ratifying or signing FCTC will give a lot of advantages for national interest. One of the justification of this is about United States is also not signing, ratifying FCTC. What's your comment about this? As I explained uh, for the previous question, uh, there are benefits of becoming a party to the convention. But even before becoming a party to the convention, uh, a country can observe the requirements of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control so that uh, you can even implement the measures uh, before uh, becoming a party to the convention. Again, uh, um, in the specific case of Indonesia, uh, while uh, the Convention Secretariat doesn't have the mandate to intervene directly, but uh, we worked with the World Health Organization. And the World Health Organization has uh, done missions in Indonesia and worked uh, with your government and with the government entities and authorities to promote uh, FCTC ratification. Um, uh, my understanding and from our angle, um, what we see is that Indonesia has not yet ratified the convention, uh, but there is an ongoing process. Uh, the, again, I need to repeat that the Secretariat's mandate uh, with respect to non-parties is very limited. But Indonesia participates at the Conference of the Parties uh, sessions as an observer 
as a, a country that has not ratified the convention. So in fact, uh, you are following what's going on under the convention. And with respect to, uh, uh, to the benefits um, uh, Indonesia may have from ratifying the treaty, I can just refer to, uh, to my previous comment that uh, you, can, uh, you can benefit from the assistance uh, framework of the uh, convention and of fully participating in the conference of the party sessions with the right to vote. Yeah, yeah, my, my question is, is uh, ratifying the convention a sort of moral obligation for countries? And uh, is there a, 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 a system put in place to, to keep tabs on uh, countries that ratify the convention? Because you, you, what happens is that even most countries, they don't even implement the local laws they pass. So what modality is being put in place to ensure that countries that ratify the convention keep to the tenet of mm, the convention? Mm, mm. We are moving forward uh, in the direction of, uh, of having a compliance committee under the framework convention. Once you have a compliance committee, the implementation by the different states will be looked at uh, regularly, uh, let's say uh, every second year, by other parties to the convention. Look at what happens with the uh, human rights treaties, uh, how their uh, compliance committee works, or the standing committees under environmental treaties. They are reviewing each other's implementation and they are making comments with respect to, to the implementation. So far, uh, without uh, a decision of the Conference of the Parties on this matter, what we can do at this stage after COP6, that if a country requires us to comment on their implementation work, then uh, we will be able to do that by requesting the expert group, which is responsible for uh, reporting and compliance under the convention. So this is what, can, uh, what we can do at this stage. And another mechanism is that uh, if that, uh, that particular country needs assistance, then uh, uh, the Secretariat can provide uh, whatever assistance uh, is mandated uh, by the Conference of the Parties. Which country are you from? Nigeria. Uh, we are in contact with the Nigerian uh, Ministry of Health, mm -hmm. and uh, it seems that uh, during this year, we will have a mission to Nigeria to look into uh, implementation matters, because it really takes very long for that uh, national legislation to uh, to pass through the parliament, and uh, we were keeping an eye on, uh, on Nigeria because uh, uh, you are a very big, influential, and important country in Africa. So uh, the Secretariat is in touch with you, and we are trying to, to provide you assistance in that work. The decision was taken at the sixth session of the Conference of the Parties in October. We are now in the process of uh, selecting the membership of the committee. So the committee uh, will be set up by uh, the end of this year. So and it can, it can already start working in the 2016 reporting period, looking at implementation matters. Wait, we're, we're technically out of time. Because we built some flexibility into the schedule this morning, I'm going to let this continue for about 10 more minutes. I know a couple of you still have questions. Do you have any other slides that you absolutely want to present to this group before we close? I think uh, if you get the presentations uh, in the slides which remain, uh, there are some examples which uh, I looked uh, at, at your countries of origin and I tried to uh, collect some information about specific implementation matters from, from your countries. So this is what, uh, uh, what are listed in, uh, in my remaining slides. And what I wanted to tell you is that based on the official communication of the parties on the implementation, we produce uh, so-called global progress reports and the latest global progress report uh, based on the 2014 reports is available and you can check them on on the web. And uh, what more? Um, I wanted to refer in a few words on the impact. The stronger measures a country puts in place, the more impact uh, it will have on 
First, the consumption. Here you can see the consumption uh, going down in the different countries which have put in place uh, uh, strong tobacco control measures in line with the convention. Uh, this is a slide uh, which uh, I was assisted with uh, by WHO. So this is the uh, pre-FCTC period and this is post-FCTC. So you can strengthen and you can uh, uh, strengthen your implementation work which may have uh, an impact on very short term. Uh, just a few um, examples. In 10 years, uh, countries can even reduce uh, um, tobacco use prevalence by about 20, 25%. And uh, Uruguay, Turkey, United Kingdom have just reported that in 10 years, since they are parties to the convention, they succeeded in reducing the prevalence by 20, 25%, which is, uh, which is a very important impact. And what else? Here on this slide, you will see some examples on how you can reduce the uh, mortality related to tobacco use. In fact, uh, improvements in tobacco-related mortality is not yet observed in all parties to the convention. But those that report on um, or that uh, collect regularly information on tobacco-related uh, uh, mortality, you can see that on these countries, which, uh, which are uh, in red here and listed here, even in uh, two years in a shorter term, but, uh, but in fact this is an impact of, uh, of a longer implementation of the convention, uh, but even uh, in the past two years, the trend related to um, uh, tobacco-related mortality is decreasing. So on short term, you can decrease prevalence, and very soon, in about a couple of years, let's say in five, 10 years, you already observe changes, uh, positive changes, improvements in morbidity and mortality related to tobacco use. That was all. Okay, do we have a couple more questions? Yeah. Who was? Wait, we, we had one starting right here. So. Okay, I'm, I'm very short. Uh, could you say in what countries the tobacco lobbies is uh, the most, uh, the strongest, and uh, uh, and what point of uh, convention is the hardest for implementation? Can you repeat that slide? Uh, in what country uh, tobacco lobby is the strongest? In fact, we do not have a score for that. But what we have, we have good examples of implementation of Article 5.3. Implementation of Article 5.3 relates to preventing tobacco industry interference with, uh, with tobacco control policies. And I need to praise the countries in Africa because the trend of including Article 5.3 preventing tobacco industry interference in the national legislation originates from Africa. Djibouti, Gambia, Gabon, and lately Kenya has introduced tobacco control legislation or amended their legislation to include specific provisions on Article 5.3. It's in the law how a public uh, official need to deal with uh, the tobacco industry to prevent the interference by the tobacco industry. So uh, if, you, if you report on that, I would, uh, I would uh, suggest that you go to the Global Progress Report on Article 5.3 and you have these countries listed. This is a new trend which is important to mention and I think that we need to go into this direction if we are to strengthen Article 5.3 implementation. Yeah, in fact, my question is related. Why don't we have a score? Because performance indicators nowadays have proved to be a very effective tool in grabbing mm -hmm. attention immediately mm -hmm. to important issues. And you are already doing a global progress report. And I heard last year a Canadian agency probably, I am not sure, but a Canadian agency uh, rating on packaging aspect, which is just one indicator of many in tobacco control. So why do we not have a global performance indicator either from WHO or from an independent agency which rates countries on how effectively they re regulate tobacco policy? Okay, uh, the Secretariat doesn't have the mandate to do so. In spite of this, we have prepared such a score but it was never published. What is published is the WHO 
uh, for the empower related indicators, which is a limited subset of indicators uh, under the convention, they provide scores. So in fact, the uh, uh, Global Tobacco Control reports of WHO, uh, they refer to such a scores. And there are uh, scientific groups which have scores. We have scores for Europe uh, on FCTC implementation, we have scores for the Eastern Mediterranean region, we have scores for different regions, but there's no centralized score. I would like to have that, but um, um, the Secretariat is uh, implementing the decisions of the Conference of the Parties, and so far we don't have a mandate for that. We would like to promote that very much. We have it in our pockets, but uh, uh, that's it. Uh, what um, more? Uh, let me explain you quickly uh, one word about um, the reporting lines. Why the WHO FCTC is different from WHO? The WHO FCTC, the Convention Secretariat, which is hosted in the WHO in Geneva, reports to the Conference of the Parties. It has uh, its own head of secretariat, and the head of secretariat reports to the Conference of the Parties. The WHO has a director general, and the director general reports to the World Health Assembly. So the reporting lines are different. That's why we used to say that the Convention Secretariat is an entity which is hosted by WHO, but is not organic part of the WHO. What we think it would be very beneficial is that we create a link between the two decision-making bodies, between the Conference of the Parties and the World Health Assembly. Because the World Health Assembly uh, usually doesn't really follow what has happened at the Conference of the Party session. So what we would like to promote is a link between the two and to use the occasion of this year's uh, World Health Assembly in May, which is the decision-making body of WJ, to report on the decisions of the COP to them, just to start creating such a link, because there needs to be a discussion between them. There needs to be the high-level officials attending the World Health Assembly know about what's going on under the first international treaty, for which the decision-making body is different. Okay, uh, my question is on the pharma, farmers. What kind of support do con countries that have ratified the FCTC get to win farmers from tobacco growing into alternative crops that are, can, the farmers can make money out of? Um, thank you. What the convention requires countries to do is to promote alternatives to, to tobacco growers. So in fact, there is no centralized fund under the convention to assist parties with, uh, with cash. But uh, we can provide technical assistance to the countries on how to go about implementation of this article. And the Conference of the Parties have adopted uh, policy recommendations and policy options on how uh, uh, alternative livelihood uh, policies and measures uh, can be implemented in the countries. And the document is already available. It was adopted at, uh, at COP6 in October last year, which, which is a very useful tool. Uh, it's a technical tool on uh, uh, how to go about it. Which crops to use, uh, what is the international experience in this area, uh, what can be the process, which kind of mechanisms can be put in place, uh, uh, for this assistance framework and so on. And we have a set of, uh, a group of experts uh, that have participated in the development of these policy options available to countries. Again, we can assist through a request. So if the request comes to the Secretariat, then we can react on that. Sir, I want to ask, is this working? I want to ask that uh, you said that the countries who have ratified the convention, they present an uh, implementation report. So how can you judge uh, that uh, a country uh, gave the accurate report to you? Because if the government is uh, preparing the report, then there may be chances that they distort the fact in order to give a good report to you. So how can you judge? Um. On one hand, implementation can be judged by, uh, by the yes and no responses and the explanations given to us. 
But again, for the time being, the Secretariat is mandated to review the reports and uh, provide uh, a feedback to the country on the content only. If the report is complete, if there is uh, additional information needed, and so on. We do not refer to compliance. Again, we cannot write back to the country saying that you have not complied with this obligation, with that obligation. This expert group with, which was established by uh, the last session of the Conference of the Parties will be able to do that upon request from the country. But uh, what I know is uh, that in many countries, the civil society, of course, is very active. And uh, Article 5.3 of the Convention uh, underlines the fact that the civil society has a very important role in implementation of the treaty in the country that is laid down in the Convention. And they do have that role. So within the country, through shadow reports or through uh, any other uh, information collection and uh, dissemination of information concerning civil society's opinion about FCTC implementation by that country, this kind of advocacy work can be done uh, by the country. And if we receive such uh, shadow reports, we can, we can use those reports in, uh, in making uh, our comments to the uh, government implementation reports. We can use those reports definitely in the needs assessment processes when we go to a country, when we interact uh, with the civil society. Uh, we have 26 observers to the Conference of the Parties which, uh, which are international NGOs. So we have NGOs that are observers to the Conference of the Parties and we work with them. So they, they can report to us, again, Framework Convention Alliance on Tobacco Control has more than 500 organizations. Many national organizations are member of the FCA. They can report and approach the Secretariat through FCA, that is an observer to the Conference of the Parties. So there are some mechanisms in place which can be used uh, by the civil society. And, uh, and of course, for the government reports, um, uh, we refer to, to the completeness uh, of the reports, and we also look at the... Uh, of the consistence of the reports. So if in your previous report uh, you reported, uh, for example, not having a specific policy, now you reported having that policy, then we ask for the supporting document. Can you send us the legislation so that we can publish that legislation as an annex to your report? And each country that have ratified, each party to the convention has its own page uh, containing the reports, any annexes, any supporting documents they submitted, which can be reviewed by everyone. And if, uh, if there are matters concerning uh, uh, the content of the report, uh, we can deal with those uh, on a regular, on a one-by-one uh, -one basis. Thank you. We're going to take one more question. Grupali has the mic, and then I'm going to turn it over to Sandy. We will stay in our seats. We're going to move right into our, our next session, which is a fairly brief one. So, Rupali, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so, the uh, committee which you said has been set up, the expert committee, will it be looking at punitive measures for countries who, which do not comply with the FCTC? Upon request. So, uh, as I said, that in the next reporting cycle in 2016, if, let's say, country X submits an implementation report and also requires that the expert committee looks into compliance and uh, formulates uh, any recommendations, then the committee will be able to do that. But for the time being, it's not mandatory. So, on request from whom? I Upon request uh, by the country by the country. So why would a country uh, ask for punitive measures? Uh, why would it request for those? In uh, 2016, all countries will be required to submit a new implementation report. You complete a form, a questionnaire, and then you submit a report with, uh, with a cover letter, which is signed uh, usually by the health minister or any other uh, relevant authority by the government. And in that cover letter, you include a sentence that we would like to require the committee on reporting and uh, compliance to look into uh, the matters of compliance and suggest us any areas where we need further strengthening of the implementation. So this is the request. Thank you.
Thank you.